Hi everyone, and welcome to Season 2 of the Becoming Women podcast with me, your host, Ella Sims. My mission with this podcast is to support teenage girls as they navigate the ups and downs of growing up. Each week, I will be speaking with a new female interviewee and asking them what they learnt during their teenage years. This season, I will be bringing you female specialists in well-being, mindfulness, authors and young female activists. By speaking with both professionals and inspiring independent women, each individual episode provides you with confidence, tools to handle any challenges you may face and the reassurance that you are not alone and those tricky teenage years will pass. This week's episode, I'm with Sharu Izadi. Sharu draws on both professional experience of working in addiction and personal experience of losing eight stone and learning to treat herself with kindness. Through her talks, workshops and one-to-one coaching, she is dedicated to sharing how self-compassion can help anyone change unwanted habits for good. I really can't wait for you to listen to this episode. Sheru is incredibly passionate about listening to the conversation we have with ourselves and finding our tribe. Oh, and I can't wait for you to hear what she has to say about her teen crush. Hi, Sheru, and welcome to the Becoming Women podcast. Hi, Ella. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. It's brilliant to be speaking with you. I wanted to ask what led you to study psychosocial sciences and psychology? I was always interested in people. I wasn't sure what to study if I was younger, when I was younger, if I'm honest. And I tried out lots of different things and dropped out of lots of different things. And at one point, my mum just said, you know what, you're, you're always observing people. You're always interested in talking to them and really listening actively. Why don't you go into psychology? And really, it was as simple as that. And it was a perfect fit for me uh, because I wasn't very academic, but I found all my lectures really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that was quite the teller that I was in the right place. And when you started, how, how was that with working with patients? What I started doing was working in an NHS addiction service in northwest London. And initially, I didn't actually have the opportunity to work one on one with clients. I was put on reception and doing filing and things like that. And so I actually learned so much by welcoming people, making them tea, hearing their stories and sort of speaking to them human to human outside of a clinical setting. Um, And then I went on to start working with people one to one. And I couldn't believe the transformations that were taking place by people who had spent a lifetime finding it difficult to change. And I realized then that the motivational tools that were available in these services was so applicable to -to day-to-day habits that people wanted to change. It didn't necessarily need to be about addiction. It could be about procrastination or, um, you know, eating habits, et cetera. And and so I was just really blown away by the clients and how amazing they were and also how effective these interventions were. And then did you have a light bulb moment when you decided that you wanted to pull your work experiences and what was working with patients and also then subsequently what was working with yourself to start writing the kindness method actually the interesting thing is I lost eight stone after a lifetime of battling with my weight and the difference this this time was that I lost it in a meaningful and sustainable joyful way and I think that was the main difference that I learned from working in addiction is that you need to be moving towards things you're excited about not just moving away from things you're not excited about I mean, when I realized how how much more easily I was um, losing weight, learning to like myself and that these new feelings of self-esteem were sticking around, I went to the School of Life, which is a place that puts on personal development courses, and I pitched this course to them. And I said, look, I'm just going to make it about habit change and see how it does. And it did exceptionally well. And a journalist contacted me and said, look, I've, I've heard that you're putting on these workshops can you help me change my habits around drinking and I did and one day I woke up and she had written an article that was exceptionally popular and through that uh, a literary agent got in touch with me and said would you like to write a book and your book in summary it's all about being more kind to yourself and giving yourself compassion so that you can help make changes or improvements to 
where you may have a habit on something or you're feeling negative about yourself? What are the first stages or steps that someone could take to um, be more kind to themselves? I think the first step really is if you're trying to change a habit to give yourself the kindness and consideration to actually ask why you're engaging in that habit. A lot of the time we think we're weak or there's something the matter with us. But the reality is when it comes to habits, what's now a problem is or once was a solution to something. And when we look at it that way, we can start understanding, oh, okay, that's why I did it. I feel, you know, you can forgive yourself for it quickly and you can kind of understand as if you were talking to a loved one why a human would have a human like you would have adopted that habit so I think in the first instance if there's ever anything you want to change about how you're behaving don't beat yourself up for it think about why you're behaving that way first question it and how did that work in practice for yourself well for me I was always thinking I was weak around certain foods and I had problems with binge eating and yo-yo dieting, et cetera. And I tried to understand why I was engaging in these behaviors, despite the fact they didn't seem to be doing anything for me. You know, they seemed to be wholly negative and really upsetting me all the time. And then I realized, well, actually, no, binge eating has also been a way that I deal with stress. It's been a comfort to me. It's been a friend to me. It may not, it may be a friend with whom I don't want to have a relationship anymore, but that doesn't mean that I can't honor and respect and acknowledge that I have had a relationship with that behavior for a long time. And it has served a purpose for me, even if now that relationship has gone sour. And so for me, it was about really understanding that. And then it, it meant that when I changed my behaviors and invariably it was difficult to do so in those moments where it was difficult, I would understand. I didn't feel out of control. I would expect those moments because I totally understood what a, a profound relationship I had with this behavior and that we really go back. So that's, that's how it helped me in my own life to understand, yeah, how it was actually serving me. And I think that's a very difficult question to ask sometimes when something's upsetting us so much. Absolutely. And how could the kindness method work for people in particular, young women? So thinking about someone who's aged between say 15 to 18, I think the kindness method is very much about listening to the conversation we have with ourselves. I think now more than ever, we're bombarded with messages about what needs fixing in us, whether it's through social media or the TV programs or whatever it is. We're constantly told, you know, whether we're conscious of it or not, this is what's the matter with you and this is how you can fix it or this is what you can buy to fix it. And I think that um, there's a lot to be said for kind of listening in. Uh, choosing to listen in on the conversation that we have with ourselves when we're less than proud of ourselves or we're disappointed in ourselves in some way because if we choose to turn up the volume and by that I mean literally just listen in to what's going on in your head you will hear that there is a conversation going on and sometimes that conversation is not very nice and I think it's about us trying to catch moments where we can listen to it and put it right and question it and ask if it's helpful, ask if it's true, the way we would if we knew that a loved one was speaking to themselves in that way. Yeah, I think it's um, really important what you say there about the way that you talk to a loved one. So if you're speaking with a sister or your mother, you would always say something positive or encouraging. But when it comes to yourself, you always pick up on the negative or you down talk yourself or you tend to overthink things and keep going with that train of thought rather than addressing it in a in a positive way absolutely and I think very often it is quite it's really as simple in terms of a first step as deciding to listen in and the 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 time when it's easiest to listen in actually or rather when the messages are most clear in my experience is when you put yourself in discomfort or you are in discomfort, either you're finding something difficult or someone has challenged or criticized you to listen in and go, okay, how am I reacting to this? Am I being reasonable? Am I considering that maybe that person's not having a great day? You know, all of these fair things that we would apply if someone said something critical to someone we love. I'm not saying that we should ignore all negative feedback or anything. I just think that very often we're quick to take it on before we've actually investigated whether we believe it, whether we respect it, whether it's useful, whether we like the way it was delivered. These are all things that can also be up to us. And I think one of the other challenges that uh, we often make or 
have is when we're trying to work on something that we don't stick to it. How can someone um, keep up with the changes that they're trying to make with a habit? One thing that I find really useful is in the early stages before your new habits have become automatic or natural to you, um, it can be helpful in the morning to take a couple of minutes to think about the sorts of things that you think might test you to go off track that day. That may be circumstances that make you stressed, things that make you want to throw in the towel, things that make you forget that you're even changing your plan in the first place, messages that you give yourself to go off track, excuses, etc. Preempt them guess what they're going to be, and then decide there and then what you're going to do when you're faced with them. Because when we do that in the morning before the day has had the opportunity to interrupt us, what we have is quite a fresh, rational, common sense approach to how we'd like to conduct ourselves that day. And by just giving it a couple of minutes thought, ideally writing it down, taking a picture of it and putting it on your phone if possible, but a couple of minutes thought will do. And just to think, huh, if I had to put my money on what would test me today and try to get me off track, what would it be? And how am I going to respond if and when it does happen? And think about how you could respond that you'd be happy with tomorrow. That has helped me enormously and a lot of my clients. (laughs) When did you start doing that for yourself? I used to do that back in the day when I was younger, when I was about 15, I did something similar in that I noticed that my, I had lots of my hormones were all over the shop and I used to keep lashing out and doing things that I later regretted. And even though it happened every single month, I still didn't seem to make the connection. (laughs) I still seemed to think that it was always circumstantial and like this month was different, et cetera. So I started writing myself letters saying, sure, there's going to be a period of time in the next few days where you're likely to think that this is true and that's true and that you're sad and nothing you like, you actually like and all these things. But just trust me, it'll be fine. A few days later, it will pass. Just trust me. And I would even write in the letter, I know you're not going to believe me right now, but trust me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it worked and it would, it would really help me. And it was also because it, it, they were my words. And I think we can become very defensive when other people are telling us what we should be doing with ourselves and how we're and feeding back on how we're acting before we have that insight into ourselves. I think that's a brilliant practice to get into and especially at the age of 15. I certainly wasn't that self-aware of my hormones or my feelings even if there was a bit of a pattern to it for for me as well. What kind of (laughs) what kind of experiences did you have as a teenager? What kind of experiences? Mm, what was that like for you or did you have any personal challenges? Yeah, I mean, I, I found it difficult. I had a stammer, which sometimes rears its head now, but it's nowhere, I mean, nowhere near as bad. I think a lot of the work that I've done on myself has certainly helped with that. And I was very overweight and I really struggled with my weight. And I found myself getting into sort of people pleasing behaviors, not really connecting with what I liked, not really giving myself time to consider what I liked because I just wanted to be cool and do things that made people like me. Um, so, yeah, I, I did find it a bit difficult to navigate. The interesting thing is, out, outwardly, I imagine a lot of more introverted characters would have thought that I was really confident. And, in, it, you know, in some ways I am. I always like to be funny and I always like to be quite loud and not even in a fake way. I genuinely do enjoy it. I come from a very positive, very fun family. But I think underneath, a lot of it was masking the fact that I was unhappy and I felt like it wasn't enough for me to just bring myself to the table as I was. I felt like I always had to have something extra that add a value of some kind so that people wanted to hang out with me. And that, yeah, that was probably the headline. <laughs> and what did you do to help improve the way that you, you felt underneath? Did you look to anyone or go to anyone to help you? I mean, I've had bouts of uh, counselling here and then, usually in response to a difficult life um, situation. But the thing is, I have four very, very close friends who are incredibly different and incredibly strong in who they are. And very, they, they've just always had a real understanding of who they are from what I can see and what they like. And they don't mind standing up for it. And even if it means a bit of confrontation these, these were always things that kind of terrified me, but I always noticed that I respected them and I never pushed back against them when they were clear on what they wanted and what they liked. I didn't think it was, it made them less likable. If, if anything, it made them 
more likable. And I certainly knew where I stood with them. Whereas I think comparatively, people didn't know where they stood with me because I'd just say yes to everything and then secretly resent it. And invariably that would come out in sort of passive aggressive ways, etc. Whereas with all of my friends, they're so clear because they know themselves, they're able to be clear with other people on what their boundaries and their limits are and what they expect and who they are, essentially. And so I think a lot of it came from observing my friends and learning that I was allowed. And I guess asking myself the question of if there's five people in a room, why are four of them allowed to have an opinion? And then the fifth is trying to see which where to sort of slot in so that no one gets upset. Why can't my opinion be OK? And in In order for that to happen, I had to also ask myself, like, why am I so scared of confrontation? Why am I scared of having an open conversation with someone who doesn't agree with me? Um, These were all things I had to learn to do in order to fully put it into play. And do you pass that advice on to young girls today? I think you work at the Amy Winehouse and help. Uh, Yeah, I work for a recovery house that's set up with Centra, um, housing and yes, it's uh, and the Amy Winehouse Foundation. And I've been working there for a while, first as a volunteer, and now I, I work there. And yeah, we do pass on. I do pass on a lot of that. I think it's quite common for us all. I mean, from every there's all sorts of approaches that will remind us that we ultimately we want to belong. We want to belong in our tribes. We want people to care for us. We want people to think that um, we want to feel that people are there for us and so sometimes we do compromise um, our needs and how we feel and so yeah I see girls doing that a lot but for the most part I have to say young women in recovery from addictions are so advanced certainly the girls I see at Amy's place are doing so well and have already been through so much that when it comes to learning these tools they can see how they can practically benefit their lives now in recovery and help them to stay in recovery Um, Mm. and so I have to say they adopt them far more quickly than I did and their emotional intelligence just completely surpasses anything I had at their age and so I think a lot of the time unfortunately it is the people who've gone through the most at a younger age who've had to develop these skills in order to stand up for themselves in order to to identify what their needs are in response to a, a, a difficult life incident or many. That must give you a great sense of, I guess, enjoyment in seeing them empower themselves and make those changes. I do. Yeah, it's my favourite part of my entire job. I definitely, it, without a shadow of a doubt, my book was dedicated to Amy's Place and they do an enormous amount for me as well. Not actually, but in terms mm-hmm. of engaging with them really, really enriches me and it teaches me so much. And it kind of keeps me up to date you know, because otherwise I'll be talking almost exclusively to people in their 30s and 40s. So um, it really does keep me up to date with the sort of themes and the difficulties that are being faced by younger women now. So for various reasons, I'm incredibly grateful to them. But yes, it is incredibly fulfilling. And yeah, as I say, it's absolutely the fav- my favourite thing that I do, including out- outside of work. That's how much I look forward to doing that work. So it's great. Yeah. Could you share what uh, current things that younger women face today? I think when it comes to body image, there's a lot of sort of mixed messages going on. People are finding it difficult to both accept their bodies as they've been told. You know, we're seeing wonderful strides made on social media, etc., where these extraordinary, extraordinarily beautiful women are coming and saying, look, I have no intention of changing my body. I think it's wonderful as it is. And I encourage you to come with me and do the same. And then they're getting conflicting messages at school or through their peers or behind closed doors. And so I think trying to manage that and trying to help people establish which path to take there clearly has is is quite difficult. I think. And what kinds of people from your line of work do you see can can make changes? I believe everyone can. But I think. The pattern that I've noticed, and that's why I've kind of picked it up in my work, the pattern that I've noticed is that the people who make changes most easily in a most meaningful and sustained way are the ones who learn to be more compassionate towards themselves and to see habit change as a curious and compassionate and forgiving and kind thing that they're doing for themselves, not remedial, punitive, I've been bad, I've been weak, etc. The people who are able to take a kinder approach to changing 
and understanding and a more academic approach to understanding why they've developed the habits that they're now not happy with. Uh, the people who sort of blindly just follow the plan end up putting, for the most part, end up putting more faith in the plan than in themselves. And so when they're met with challenge or a situation where that they hadn't prepared for, very often they're more prone to make excuses and caveats to kind of move away from the discomfort and go off track. Whereas people who are in the habit of kind of observing a craving and an urge are more able to treat it as an alert as opposed to a command that tells them what to do. That's excellent advice and things to look out for. Thank you. Pleasure. I'm going to lighten the mood and ask a series of quick fire questions. Mm -hmm. So who was your teen crush? Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> very favourite. Uh, very, not very favourite. Yes, he's very popular. Um, <laughs> what about a favourite song? The Boxer by Paul Simon, probably. Yeah, The Boxer by Paul Simon. And do you have a particular embarrassing memory or moment that sticks with you from being a young girl? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I, in a talent show, I haven't thought about this in about 25 <laughs> years. In a talent show when I was about 13, I went to an all-girls school. Uh, we formed the Spice Girls and I played Scary Spice and I put oranges in my bra and danced for the whole school <laughs> um <laughs> thinking about it now I mean, it's funny that I think back and consider that I didn't have much confidence because that was really something but yeah that's I don't know why that's what crevice of my memory that's just come out of but yeah that was that's not my favorite <laughs> <laughs> excellent thank you pleasure um, and I ask all guests two final questions. And the first one is, looking back, what would you advise your younger self? So knowing what you know now and the experiences that you've been through, what would mm -hmm. you tell your 15-year-old self? I think I would say that worrying isn't going to better prepare you for a difficult situation. It's one thing to consider how you'll react if something happens, but it's, it's, you'll never be able to guess the things that are going to challenge you. So you're far, it's, a, it's a better plan to think about building your resilience, building how good you feel, essentially, and how strong you feel so that if and when you are faced with a challenge, you're better placed to deal with it in a way that you're happy with. I think I used to think that worrying about something was to prepare. But I actually, when I got to it, the more I worried, the more sort of depleted and exhausted I was. And so it actually left me less able to deal with it in a way that I was happy with. So I would say don't put value in worrying because you think it's helping you prepare. So having the confidence that if something arises that um, isn't particularly nice or could make you feel uncomfortable that you can handle it in that moment. Yeah, not just the confidence, but also put your energy into making yourself feel good in whatever way you can, because when we feel good, we're more resilient. So do the things that make you feel great. If that's exercise, drinking water, connecting with positive people, even if at the back of your mind there's something pending or you're worried about something, I think your best bet is to channel that energy into things that make you feel positive in the meantime, safe in the knowledge that if and when, yeah, you are challenged by something external, you're, you're better placed to deal with it. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you. And if you could give a gift to teenage girls all over the world, anything, what would that be? Fearlessness. I think I've grown up with an enormous amount of fear. When I speak to other women, it's the same. We talk about imposter syndrome, the fear of being caught out, etc. <sighs> There's really no need, need to fear. Everyone's got your back. It's going to be great. <laughs> Don't worry. I think that's really powerful. Thank you so much. Well, it's been brilliant speaking today. Thank you, Shuri. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to Becoming Women with me, Ella Sims. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please follow me on Twitter or Instagram or visit www.becomingwomen.com. I'd love it if you could please share this podcast with anyone you know who would enjoy listening to it. And if you are a young girl, I'd love to hear your feedback on today's episode. So feel free to send me a DM. See you next week. <laughs>